Good afternoon, IONS leaders and IONS observers. It's a great honour for me to be here to present some ideas for enhancing maritime security cooperation in the Indian Ocean region, or IOR. My presentation, in fact, nicely complements that given by Professor Michael Lestrange, although we didn't share notes beforehand. A little bit of overlap, but generally I think uh, it's a nice fit. So our maritime forces are, of course, on the front line of maritime security prevention, response and recovery operations. Our business is fundamentally about dealing with maritime security risk. In this short presentation, I will cover three things. Concepts of risk, vulnerability, and maritime security as they relate to the IOR. The outcomes of an in indicative IOR maritime security risk context review and assessment. And recommendations that IONS, in support of regional governments and regional entities like the Indian Ocean Rim Association, or IORA, consider initiating and advocating risk-based approaches for progressing regional maritime security cooperation. My focus here is primarily on non-traditional maritime security issues, while recognising that the boundaries between non-traditional and traditional security are blurred and tend to overlap to some extent. In the IOR, the non-traditional maritime security challenges, in the medium to longer term, present the greatest need for cooperation and provides the opportunities, if we are prepared to grasp them, of developing the mechanisms and habits for cooperation that may also help us deal with traditional security concerns. In many respects, our convergent national interests in non-traditional maritime security presents the low-hanging fruit for interstate and inter-maritime force cooperation. We share significant challenges in our vast, diverse and disparate maritime region, particularly in devising cooperative approaches to addressing common and to an extent shared maritime security problems, and our previous speaker touched on some of those. Many of our challenges transcend national boundaries and are beyond the remit and capabilities of any single nation to deal with. A significant initial challenge is to find ways for the primary players, the regional and littoral and extra-regional states, and their maritime forces and agencies to participate in the same game on a common playing field. So our first task, therefore, is to find a common basis for understanding the problems and developing options for dealing with them. As we work toward common approaches, they, they need to be based upon shared perspectives that will underpin uncontroversial and non-threatening collaborative strategies for enhancing mutually beneficial maritime security. Approaches to maritime security built upon shared perspectives of risks and vulnerabilities supported by tried, tested and widely employed risk management frameworks offers mechanisms and processes that can help us with this task. Risk management approaches, if employed assiduously, can help us develop shared understandings of threats to our common objectives and importantly can help us identify shared opportunities for mitigating commonly held risks and reducing vulnerabilities. Those of you with an intellectual bent wishing to explore the academic thinking behind risk in an international context might look at Ulrich Beck's World Risk Society and related works. Here in our practical world, the International Organisation for Standardisation, or ISO 31000-2009 Risk Management Principles and Guidelines presents an internationally accepted conceptual framework and process, a structured approach to dealing with uncertainty. Now, I am not advocating that ISO 31000 provides the entire answer to our quest. However, I suggest that it provides a very useful starting point. Some of you will be familiar with this document and others less so. Let me identify some essential elements and relate them to the IOR Maritime Security Challenge. Risk is defined as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. This simple and concise definition seems straightforward. However, it assumes the existence of some kind of organisation that has objectives. In the IOR maritime security case, our primary focus 
needs to be on the integrating and interconnected nature of the sea as it affects the shared objectives of those ashore. Viewing the IOR as a virtual organisation that is an open, expansive and inclusive maritime system, a composite oceanic and littoral region in which regional and extra-regional actors have common objectives, interests and shared risks and vulnerabilities presents a workable basis for our purposes. There are three broad phases to the risk management continuous cycle. Firstly, establishing the context, which entails articulating objectives, defining the parameters, and setting the scope and criteria. Note that the need to understand the security context is consistent with traditional military strategic concepts advocated, for example, by Clausewitz and Corbett that emphasise the importance of understanding the nature of a war or a conflict. Secondly, risk assessment, which is the overall process of identifying, analysing and evaluating the risks, and then risk treatment, which involves selecting and applying options for removing, modifying or tolerating risks. Unlike risk, there is no single internationally accepted definition of vulnerability. We need a workable definition because in assessing risk to security, the probability and scale of hazards are often not numerically measurable. Qualitative, qualitative analyses is required in addition to quantitative analysis. The actions of irrational actors like suicide bombers and the cumulative impacts of climate change, for example, are almost impossible to predict with any degree of confidence. For our purposes, vulnerability can be defined as the state of susceptibility to harm from exposure to risks posing unquantifiable uncertainty combined with insufficient capacities to prevent, respond or adapt. And finally, there is no internationally accepted definition of maritime security. Professor Sam Bateman, uh, an esteemed colleague of mine, characterised the inability for regional countries in the Asia-Pacific to agree on a definition as a basic wicked problem that presents difficulties for endeavours to develop regional cooperative approaches. We need to think about security in its broadest and most inclusive sense, particularly as it intersects and overlaps with notions of economic, environmental, energy, human and food security in the maritime domain. I have devised and recommend for consideration a definition for our work in the IOR as follows. Maritime security is a comprehensive concept that derives from the systemic nature of the maritime domain presenting multiple and interrelated requirements for cooperative security by state and non-state actors. It addresses traditional and non-traditional security challenges. Maritime security involves coordinating collective and cooperative risk mitigation and vulnerability reduction efforts in order to protect and promote national, regional and global vital interest objectives and core values, including those relating to state sovereignty, freedom of navigation, economic development, environment and ocean resources, human and social development and political stability. I will now briefly outline the product of my evolving independent strategic level review of IOR maritime security risks and vulnerability that is very much a work in progress. A strategic risk assessment for a region as large, complex and varied as the IOR requires the combined efforts of many experts being drawn together. The Maritime Security Risk Context Review is presented under the following headings, and again there's a little bit of overlap here with the previous speaker, of course. Law of the Sea, Economy, Trade and Globalisation, Energy, Environment and Ocean Resources, social cohesion and development, potential for interstate conflict and regional security architecture. A time horizon of 30 years and beyond is necessary to consider trends for issues like climate change. Generic strategic objectives for the IOR are presented at the end. So the key elements under each heading are as follows. Law of the sea. Maritime sovereignty defines rights and responsibilities and underpins traditional security issues like border security, as well as non-traditional security factors like resource 
and environmental exploitation and management. Most maritime boundaries in the IOR have been satisfactory delimited, although varying interpretations of UNCLOS can magnify jurisdictional tensions. Freedom of navigation. The integrity of the Indian Ocean slocks is, as we all know, vitally important to the interests of regional and, and extra-regional actors. Freedom of navigation to facilitate trade and permit the legitimate passage of warships and other activities like resource exploitation and scientific research is a foundational principle of UNCLOS. Restriction on transit, for example, through the Straits of Malacca, Hormuz and Babel Mendeb can be problematic. Further, expansive interpretations of coastal state authority like EEZs, for example, that go beyond the letter and intent of UNCLOS can create tensions. And then conservation conservation and protection of the marine environment and resources. Comprehensive integrated approaches to oceans governance advocated by UNCLOS are not being implemented in many areas within the national jurisdiction in the IOR, although there are efforts in this direction. Similarly, efforts to promote integrated oceans governance in the high seas are at a nascent stage and many IOR littoral states have limited capabilities to effectively police their maritime jurisdictions. Economy, trade and globalisation. The emergence of prominent, prominence in the IOR economically is well documented. Uneven economic development is profoundly evident and while some economies in the IOR continue to experience strong growth, many regional economies are largely commodity based and the economic outlook is fragile. The pressures of globalisation are heightened in the IOR due to grossly uneven effects for states, institutions and peoples. Developing IOR states, for example, are less able to participate and are likely to become increasingly marginalised and disenfranchised, providing resources for regional security problems that will impact all participants in the IOR maritime system. Energy. Energy security in the IOR is crucial to global and regional economies and access to West Asian oil remains a vital issue. Note I said West Asian, not Middle Eastern. I think we need to move on from the colonial um, names of the past. The IOR slocks are the most, world's most strategically important energy trade routes. The geopolitics of world energy is changing the imperative for the world's greatest sea power, the United States, to support energy security in the IOR is declining, while the strategic states for China and India, for example, continue to rise. India, for example, has a 132% forecast increase in energy demand through to 2035, and most of this is to be imported by sea. Environmental and ocean resource issues exacerbated by, exacerbated by the impacts of climate change are emerging as the greatest maritime security related challenges for the IOR in the medium to longer term. And I know the, the conference theme is about protecting trade, but I would suggest in some subsequent con con conferences, IONS conferences, this issue, issue may well be a uh, primary theme. The IOR littoral includes extensive coastal zones. Predictions of rising sea levels and temperatures combined with the increasing incidence and severity of extreme weather events are likely to have dire impacts where vast populations live in low-lying coastal zones and rely to a significant extent on the sea for their livelihoods. Climate change, environmental degradation, resource scarcity and natural disasters will have profound geostrategic implications in the IOR. The effects will transcend borders and will be felt in coastal areas and the maritime domain. Many IOR states are extremely vulnerable and have little capacity to adapt and respond. Social cohesion and development. The IOR is known for its societal diversity, complexity and conflict. The IOR harbours the majority of the world's refugees, internally displaced persons and international migrants seeking a better life. Massive migration generates enormous 
economic, social, political and security challenges that are likely to intensify and have ma major implications for regional stability and maritime security. Social, political and economic disintegration in the IOR provides a fertile environment for the proliferation of law and order issues. Organised crime flourishes where institutions are weak or non-existent. Now to the potential for interstate conflict. The largest emerging issue is the strategic rivalry between China and India, which until recently had entailed territorial disputes on land. China, India and other states that have hitherto relied upon US assured maritime security must increasingly look to providing their own security insurance. China and India are making considerable investments in naval forces. Both have expanding strategic and economic power combined with national security agendas that significantly focus upon maritime strategy and sea power. China is strategically vulnerable owing to dependence upon IOR slots straddled by India that pass through narrow northwest and northeast cho choke points. Opportunities for strategic miscalculation at sea will inevitably arise as the two Asian great powers project power and endeavour to assert sea control. The possession and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, WMD, particularly nuclear weapons, remains a most troubling transnational problem. There exists the possibility of miscalculations between nuclear states and the abiding prospect of nuclear weapons or other WMD falling into the hands of terrorists. As we've seen in the past, Indian Ocean conflicts on land have repeatedly had maritime security consequences. And most regional states have limited maritime enforcement capabilities. Many are unable to effectively patrol their marine zones. The lack of national capabilities is exacerbated by the lack of cooperative bodies to coordinate sparse resources and manage crises. And the involvement of external states can help to stabilise regional security. In many cases, such involvement is essential to make up for shortfalls in the security capabilities of regional states, although external intervention is not universally welcomed. Now, just a few words for regional security architecture, noting this has been quite well covered. Um, but generally, the architectures, as we've heard already, are lacking in our region. The Indian Ocean Rim Association does not include security in its charter, and its membership is restrictive. Several important Iowa littoral states are not members. However, as outlined earlier, four of the six priority areas for Iora work potentially involve enhancing maritime security, and I, I say appropriately. Maritime security and safety is number one, fisheries management, disaster risk management and academic science and technology. The only other region-wide maritime security entity is IONS, which has a more expansive membership. And as Professor Lestrange lamented, there is no IOR track to anything like the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific or CSCAP. So from this risk analysis, 15 generic IOR strategic objectives for maritime security are listed on the next two slides. These slides are busy, I don't expect you to read them all, and the information behind them is in the supporting paper, which I'm sure you'll all study, or your staffs might. Um, the first three strategic objectives I'll just highlight. They are about maritime territorial sovereignty, freedom of navigation, and of course, marine environmental protection in national jurisdiction and the high seas. On the next page of the next uh, group of objectives, and I'll highlight again just a couple of these. Number 12, impose law and order consistent with international regimes and norms. And number 15, develop regional maritime security dialogue and cooperation architectures in the IOR. So we'll now move on to the IOR maritime security risk assessment. The risk assessment aims to identify factors that may threaten the achievement of objectives and importantly it can be used to highlight opportunities that can be pursued. A significant outcome of the risk assessment process 
is to identify priorities that will inform subsequent treatment options. A risk criteria framework provides a useful tool for developing comparative perspectives of the relative imperatives to address particular risks. This usually involves consideration of the likelihood of a risk arising along with the consequences should it occur. The combination of likelihood and consequence can be used to determine the overall level of risk. So I've identified 19 generic strategic Iowa maritime security risks which are listed on the next two slides. Again, I don't expect you to read these. They're in the supporting paper and I'll just highlight a couple of them so that you get the idea. So amongst the top five risks shown here are uh, again to do with sovereignty uh, over the EZ, the territorial sea, sovereignty claims, closures of international straits and restrictions on freedom of navigation. On the next slide, I'll highlight uh, a couple of the risks. Firstly, inadequate regulation and control of the marine environment, law and, law and order at sea transgressions like crime, piracy, robbery, smuggling, trafficking, illegal immigration and IUU fishing. And I'll just underline safety at sea, of course, which is another common risk that we all share. A composite picture of risks against objectives presents a useful strategic overview that can highlight discontinuities and areas of convergence. Opportunities are presented for targeting collective and cooperative maritime security risk mitigation efforts. A concise supporting narrative is also necessary. So on this busy looking schema, basically what you're seeing is a overall IOR maritime security risk assessment matrix um, the numbers relate to the 15 strategic objectives down the y-axis and the 19 maritime security risks uh, across the x-axis at the top. The colour code it signifies the overall levels of risk, red for high, amber for moderate and green for lower risks. And an x indicates where the strategic objectives impact with a particular maritime security risk. Again, this is presented so that you get the, a sense of the outcomes of this sort of process. And as you can see on that slide, the law and order at sea strategic objective under objective 12 um, pretty much intersects with all of the maritime security risks are affected or affect law and order at sea in one way or another. And similarly, a regional security architecture, um, comprehensive and multi-layered as outlined by Professor Lestrange, actually um, interacts with all of the maritime security risks in one way or another. So now I'll move to a concluding summary and some recommendations. In this overview of the IOR strategic risk context and assessment, the C is a vital common medium. The IOR SLOCs are central to regional trade and vital to the global economy. And as the global economic and strategic balance swings towards Asia with India, Indonesia and other IO states emerging, and as an increasingly powerful China looks south and west, so the geopolitical focus on the IO magnifies. Changes in regional power balances with China and India rising and the United States relatively declining are major factors that impact security. However, it is the potential consequences from climate change that in my view are likely to have the greatest impact in the medium to longer term. They all present profound challenges to regional environmental, human, food and economic security. There is much uncertainty which equates to unmitigated risk in the IOR maritime security context. Many IOR states have little or no capacity to fulfil their responsibilities for managing marine zones. Few regional countries have the capacity to deal with massive human tragedies, environmental damage to coastal areas forecast to arise from repeated natural disasters. The lack of nat national capabilities is exacerbated by the lack of cooperative bodies to coordinate the use of sparse resources. Understanding risks and vulnerabilities in the IOR presents the potential for regional actors to engage in a positive, constructive and non-confrontational approach that will assist in defining common maritime security challenges and opportunities. 
risk management offers methodologies for defining collective mitigation strategies, regional agendas for action. Cooperative maritime security in the IOR could, if managed astutely and prudently, bind a diverse and largely disaggregated region against a range of risks that no single state has the abili ability to mitigate. So now for some recommendations. While I acknowledge that s some are probably beyond the purview of IONS, I believe IONS leaders can be influential in encouraging progress. Firstly, and again this is consistent with our previous speaker, there is a need to commission a multinational, multidisciplinary team of experts to conduct a regional strategic risk assessment with a specific focus upon maritime security leading to proposals for enhanced IOR maritime security cooperation. This could start as an IONS initiative. The recommendation that IONS encourage IORA to expand the priority agenda to include the maritime aspects of climate change to complement maritime safety and security, disaster response and fishing. IONS should encourage expansion of IORA membership to be more inclusive of IOR participating states. And again, consistent with the previous speaker, IONS encourage support the creation of a Track 2, Track 1.5 IOR security dialogue entity. The Indian Ocean Research Group could provide the foundation if appropriately supported and resourced. And finally, IONS support the creation of a separate Track 1 IOR security dialogue entity or expand the terms of reference of IOR to include security. So there is an imperative to develop maritime security cooperation in the Indian Ocean region to address traditional and primarily non-traditional security risks and vulnerabilities. The maritime domain is where the collective interests and common security concerns of regional and extra-regional states largely converge. Both regional and extra-regional actors, those with interest in the Indian Ocean and the capacity to assist need to be included in security dialogue and cooperative arrangements. Combined risk, vulnerability and security approaches, in my view, offer the potential to move forward. Thank you.